Welcome. We have several visitors here this morning. We are grateful that you've come out our way. Uh, if you have some questions after the service today, questions about the congregation, about our beliefs and teachings, questions about Greensboro, please feel free to ask. We are not offended by questions. Although I will warn you, if you ask me questions about Greensboro, I will not be a very good source of information. But there are a lot of people here that live here and can help you out with those kinds of questions. So we are grateful that you are here. If you have been in the stores lately, you know what season it is. Well, maybe you don't. Because I noticed back before Halloween, they were putting up Christmas decorations. Now, I'm old enough to remember a time when you had to wait until after the event that takes place next Thursday before they started advertising for Christmas. That event, of course, is Thanksgiving. And I don't know what Thanksgiving is to you, but to a lot of people, it's a lot of different things, I guess. But it is a good time for us to stop and think about some things. The Jews, if you'll go back and read the book of Leviticus, something that's not commonly read by most of us on a regular basis, but one of the sacrifices that God outlines in the book of Leviticus, I believe in chapter 7, y'all know, I'll get there, sorry. He's doing sign language and I'm not reading very well here. I will turn this on in just a minute, so just keep you in suspense. Maybe you'll listen better for a couple minutes. Now, where was I? Oh, Leviticus 7. The Jews had a sacrifice. That was a sacrifice of thanksgiving. When someone had something occur and they wanted to say a special thank you to God, they could go down to the temple and they offered a special sacrifice. God says, when you do that, here's how I want you to do it. You couldn't do it just any old way. But God said, there may be a time when you'll want to do this. That's wonderful. Here's how I would like for you to do that. The New Testament contains no such instructions concerning a special sacrifice to be made. But we should be a thankful people. Now, come Thursday, several things are going to happen. First, you might see something like this. At our house, it won't look like this, and it won't matter because it won't look like anything after about five minutes. But Thanksgiving is traditionally a time of feasting. I grew up in a neighborhood where there were a lot of working folks and there wasn't a lot of money. And a lot of times folks didn't have much at the end of the month. But always on Thanksgiving, there was a feast. There was more than enough food. They had leftovers for two or three days. It became my favorite time of the year. Not because of that, but because I got to go visit my grandmother. And she always had some special things for us. You know, she always had those little, what were they, 10-ounce Coca-Colas? We didn't get those growing up, but she always had them at Thanksgiving. She made her special cookies, which I still haven't gotten anybody to make, but that's beside the point. She also had something called date nut pudding that I have been able to have on Thanksgiving since then. A lot of good memories. A lot of memories are formed. Something that many of us are thankful for on that day are some of the memories from the past from that day. It's a good thing. Then there is, whoops, now I have to change things here. And this is, now it's on. Too many buttons. Family. This, by the way, is a picture of the Waltons. I figure everybody knows who the Waltons are. They're in reruns on cable. <laughs> they were the ideal family. I would like to have grown up on Walton's Mountain most of the time. It's a time when families get together. We don't do that nearly enough anymore as a nation. We're too scattered abroad. Some of our visitors this morning, I'm guessing maybe you're in town for Thanksgiving. If not, my apologies for making that assumption, but that's when a lot of people come home so they can visit family, so they can have that feast on that special day and they can catch up and have fun and do some of the other things associated with that day. And then there's always something else that's guaranteed. And that's football. And no, I'm not a Dallas Cowboys fan, but I've learned they will be playing on Thanksgiving. I could have put the Detroit Lions up here, but I had bad memories from a Thanksgiving with them several years ago with the team I do like, so I chose not to. 
And it's a tradition in many families. After you eat that big lunch, you sit down in front of the TV and you start to watch the football game and in some families, everybody finds a comfortable place and falls asleep during that game if they're not Dallas Cowboys fans or whoever happens to be playing. But those are some traditions. I was listening to someone on the radio just the other day talk about a tradition they have in their family. Everybody that sits at the table got at least had one or two pieces of dried corn, little kernels. And at some point during the meal, they would pass around a uh, special bowl, and each person in turn would put one of those kernels in and talk about something they were thankful for that year. I thought that was kind of interesting. I know a lot of families will do that. They'll go around the table and somebody has to say something they're grateful for, something they're thankful for. But as Christians, when should we be thankful? Well, this fit when it was on my computer screen. <laughs> and it also didn't all show up at once. So one of the things I'll be thankful for in the future is when I figure out how to use this newest version of PowerPoint, because I had the old one figured out. But as Christians, well, even that didn't show up. Let me get back here so I can read this whole thing. Every day is Thanksgiving for God's people. It should be. Now, right about now, some of you might be thinking, yeah, but there are some days that there's just not much to be thankful for. Maybe. But let me suggest to you there are probably still some things to be thankful for, even on bad days. I know there are some awful things go on in the world. I watched a movie recently with a friend, and it, the setting was Jerusalem. And the depiction of the Jerusalem, the people of Jerusalem was just... I, I thought maybe it was a little over the top, and then I talked to the fellow I was watching the movie with, and he said, no, no, I've been to Jerusalem many, many times. He goes over there for archaeological digs nearly every year for the last 20 years, I guess. He said they're a very fatalistic people. They live in the moment. They expect to die at any moment. They're just pessimistic and not thankful at all. We don't want to become that way. I know there are bad things happen in this country, but there's a lot of good things that happen in this country. I have a few quotes here from some people before we look at what God had to say. G.K. Chesterton said, when it comes to life, the critical thing is whether you take things for granted or take them with gratitude. And again, some of those things that we don't think about being thankful for, maybe are things we should be thankful for. We'll talk more about that in a moment. A lady named Joyce Meyer commented, I'm not where I need to be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. You ever think about that? May not be happy with where you are and what's happening at the moment, but can you be thankful you're not where you were back there in the past somewhere? Those of us that weren't raised in Christian families, I guarantee we can be thankful for that. Here's a statement by Helen Keller. I found this to be very enlightening. For three things, I thank God every day of my life. Now, this is a lady who could not see and could not hear and spent the first few years of her life in just her own little world where she, I don't know, I don't understand how that could be. I don't know how she could think about things because she had nothing to help her think. She had no words. She had no vision. You probably studied her life in school. Remember the lady that finally taught her some things and she just went, I guess we might say crazy, trying to learn everything she could learn. But to hear this lady talk like this, listen to what she said. For three things I thank God every day of my life. Thanks that he has vouchsafed, vouchsafed, well, vouchsafed me knowledge of his work. That I got to learn about him 
and his works. Deep thanks that he has set, my dark, set in my darkness the lamp of faith. Deepest thanks that I have another life to look forward to. A life joyous with light and flowers and heavenly song. You ever think about heaven? I heard a preacher once said, we're too busy taking care of life here to think about heaven. We shouldn't be. Sometimes maybe we are. And then there's C.S. Lewis. I don't know if you really know the story of C.S. Lewis. He was a philosopher, an atheist, who through his philosophy and thinking came to the realization there had to be a God. Became a Bible believer. I don't know all there is to know about his faith, but he came to believe in God and trust in God. He said this, we ought to give thanks for all fortune, all fortune, if it is good because it's good, if bad because it works in us patience, humility, contempt of this world, and the hope of our eternal country. Think about that. When bad things happen, it should remind us that we live in an imperfect world. And I don't want to spend the rest of my days, that is eternity, in an imperfect world. I don't know about you. There's a perfect one coming. There's no night. There's no sickness, there's no pain, there's no suffering, there's no separation. We serve a God who made all that possible by the event we just commemorated a few moments ago. It says on the front of this table, do this in memory of me. Remembering the sacrifice that he made. And the sacrifice that was made available to everyone in this world, including all those folks out there doing all those evil and wicked things, that we might have some influence in helping to change. How? Uh, I don't know. Maybe you'll get to talk to one personally. I can tell you about a man who used to sit in a bar and put a cigar on the ashtray and hope somebody would knock it off so he could get in a fight. He became a Christian. About three or four years ago, a man put him in a headlock, put a gun to his head, and robbed him, and then he was questioning whether he ought to press charges or not. Now, I think he went a little too far to the other extreme, but my question is, how does somebody go from one to two? And the answer is Christ. The impact he can have in the world. But for Christians every day, should be thanksgiving. Turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 4 verse 2, verse 2, since you probably can't read this passage up on the screen. Colossians chapter 4 verse 2. Continually, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Question, when you pray, do you always do it with thanksgiving? Don't know. I can think of times when I didn't. Occasionally, it can be turned into a very large complaining session. God, woe is me. Why is all this happening to me? Please take all this away. You ever felt like that? Never prayed like that? Paul says do it all with thanksgiving. Just the fact he wants you to talk to him is enough to be thankful here is the creator of the universe. And he wants to hear from you. He wants to know how you're feeling, what you're thinking, what you're concerned about. Back when I used to work for a living, that's what somebody said before I became a preacher, I worked for a living. There was a company president 
He'd occasionally come through where I was working, and you know what his attitude was to all the workers? That's how much concern he gave us. That's how much he talked to us. That He wouldn't even acknowledge us with a wave. He just had to get from point A to point B and had to go through. He didn't even build the company. He just happened to get hired to run it. Here's the creator of the universe wants to hear from us. He wants you to pray. I'm going to do these out of order. Look at Philippians 4, 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Be not, or be anxious for nothing. In other words, be calm. Don't be in a state of anxiety. God is still in control. He's still on the throne. I don't understand why he allows some things to happen that happen, but he does, and he's going to do a better job of it than I will. He set this world up, for example, to operate on laws and principles. I watched a special a while back about, uh, yeah, that park out west, Yellowstone. You know, at one time, they had eradicated the wolves from Yellowstone National Park. And then somebody got to paying attention, and they started losing a lot of their trees. And new ones weren't growing up, and they couldn't figure out what was wrong. And somebody was hired to come in and do a study. And they determined what was happening is the elk and the deer had too much time on their hands, and so they could spend a lot of time eating all the new trees. And they couldn't grow to maturity. And they had all that time on their hands because they didn't have to keep looking around for wolves after them. So they reintroduced the wolf, and guess what happened? The trees started growing again. In Australia, they imported a certain toad, I believe it was, cane toad, to help take care of a bug problem. And now the toads are the problem. God works it out pretty well when we leave him to his devices. We mess it up when we start interfering too much. So don't be anxious. He's in control. He knows what he's doing. Talk to him about it. Ask him for the wisdom to make the right response. Don't be anxious. But let him know what your requests are. Pray to him with your supplications, but be thankful when you do that because he is God. And maybe my favorite in this group, Daniel 6.10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, that's the writing from the king that said anybody who prayed to any other god or any other person or any other thing for 30 days would be thrown in the lion's den. Now think about this. Daniel is an old man. I know some of the pictures of Daniel in the lion's den. He looks young. No. He's probably 85, 90 years old at this point. If he was 10 when he went into captivity, he's at least 80 at this point. He has spent probably most, if not all, of his adult life as a servant to a foreign king in the midst of idol worshipers where his God is not honored most of the time. He is surrounded by people who don't like him because he has too much influence with the king. You ever had that problem at work? And now he just found out that he's not allowed to pray to God for 30 days or he's going to be fed to the lions. If you've ever watched any of those commentaries or programs on television showing lion eating impalas and other things, you don't want to die that way. So what does Daniel do? When he knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room, with the windows open towards Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day 
and prayed and gave thanks to God as was his custom since early days. Let that sink in. This decree was made because the people knew the only way they could find an accusation against Daniel was his religion and his faith in God. And he did not disappoint them. When he went to that upper room, or went to his room, and he opened those windows and he knelt down that first time to pray, he had to know that someone was going to let the king know he had violated this brand new decree. And he didn't care. He nailed down and he prayed and gave thanks. Gave thanks. God is still God. He's still on the throne. He's still the one in control. And if Daniel dies, he gets to go to heaven. Why not give thanks? I hope I could be like Daniel. I hope you could be like Daniel. But the only way to be like Daniel is to have a relationship with God where we are truly grateful for who he is and what he does for us each and every day. For the little things and the big things. Be anxious for nothing. I wonder if Daniel had a little anxiety that first time he knelt down. The second time he knelt down. The third time he knelt down. We'll never know. But the point is, he went ahead and prayed and gave his thanks to God. And gave God the glory and the honor and the service. Despite what was awaiting him. Every day, despite the circumstances, should be a day of thanksgiving for Christians. Because of what was done for us to make it possible for us to have that hope. We know that one day we'll stand before God and have to give an account. There's going to be a judgment. That judgment is going to be sentencing. The sentencing will be one of two things. It's either guilty of sin, depart from me, or well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. You'll either be guilty of rejecting him or, I'm not sure how to put this, so I'm just going to say guilty of accepting him. And when you're guilty of accepting him, it's going to be well done if you've been a faithful servant. I challenge you, if you don't have a concordance, find one. You can go online and find a concordance and just look up the words thankful, thanksgiving, giving thanks. And see how many times the subject comes up. How many times in the New Testament, I only gave you two New Testament passages. There are numerous passages that talk about us giving thanks. When we pray, it should be a part of our prayers. Thankful to God for who he is and what he does. Despite the circumstances or in the midst of those circumstances because no matter what I have hope you have hope Peter wrote to those folks in 1st Peter chapter 1 and said we have a life giving hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead this world is not the end death is not the end there's going to be a resurrection in that judgment scene and we can have the opportunity or heaven. If that's not enough to be thankful for in this life, I don't know what is. A good friend of ours just passed away in Springfield, Ohio. She was in her 80s. Her name was Gwen. And the church was not always very kind to Gwen, unfortunately. I could go into some details, but I won't. But a lot of people would have quit would have given up on God under the circumstances she was under. She didn't do it. She kept on going. She stayed faithful. 
because she loved God and she wanted to go to heaven. She wanted to spend eternity in the presence of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and take part in all that's going to be there. And she used to talk to me about how thankful she was for things. We all need to be like her. We all need to be like Daniel. We all need to heed what Paul said to the Philippians and the Colossians. When you pause on Thursday, amidst all the feasting and the family and the football, are you going to think about God? Will you truly be thankful to him? But then the question is, will you be thankful on Wednesday, and Tuesday, and Monday, and Saturday, and Friday, following Thursday, every day? Daniel's practice was every day, three times a day. He gave thanks to God. Am I saying you have to do it three times? No. That's between you and God. But are you thankful? One other quote, and the lesson will be yours. I'll paraphrase. Someone said, the true expression of thanksgiving is to put something into practice. If you're truly thankful for what Christ has done, if you're truly thankful to the God, the Father, who sent him, then you need to put into practice the teachings of our Lord. You need to strive to live a faithful, devoted life every day. Jesus put it this way. The wise man built his house upon the rock. And the rains came and the winds blew. And that house stood because it was founded on a rock. But if you back up to see who's in the analogy is the one who builds on the rock. It's the person who hears the words of Jesus and does them. So how thankful are you? What kind of life are you living for him? If it's not the life that he wants, you can change that this morning. I don't know anybody's situation with God but my own. But if you haven't offered his, accepted his offer of salvation, you can do so. It's easy enough to understand. Read through the book of Acts and notice all the common things that took place. They're either going to be stated or implied. All but one's always stated. I'll talk to you about that when we get to it. That's belief in Christ. And that belief, according to Paul in Romans 10, is that God raised him from the dead. He defeated death. So you believe in Christ. You repent of your sins. Acts 2.38. First word out of Peter's mouth in response to the question, what must we do? Repent. Make the confession of Christ as Lord. Paul said Jesus made that confession before Pontius Pilate, and Timothy made it before many witnesses, and then be immersed, baptized in water by the authority of Christ for the remission of your sins. That's Acts 2.38, Acts 22, verse 16, and every other case of conversion in between. The one thing that's always mentioned when we have details is baptism. And if you want to know what the purpose of baptism is, just listen to the words of Ananias to Saul of Tarsus. King James translation, why tarriest thou? Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. If you haven't done that, that's where you begin following the teachings of Christ. Not my idea. It's what he said. If you're not sure about that, I'll gladly sit down with you and study it further. Other people here I know will sit down and study it with you. But if you know this morning that you haven't done that and you need to, we have a baptistry. It's not in this room, but we have it, and it won't take long to have it set up and ready to go. We will gladly take your confession and immerse you based upon your belief and repentance so that you can be like that Ethiopian eunuch and arise from that baptism and go on your way rejoicing. Maybe you're a child of God, someone who's done that. And you followed the Lord for a period of time, but somewhere along the line, you stopped being thankful. Maybe you started being resentful. 
you haven't really been following him, you're here this morning and that's good, but there's more than just being here to being a Christian. How do you stand before the Lord this morning? Are you truly thankful? Have you accepted his offer of salvation so that you truly can be thankful? So that you won't be where you were? Outside of Christ or inside of Christ? Which is it for you this morning? Think about it in all seriousness, in light of eternity, as together we stand and sing. I must needs go home by the way of the cross. There's no other way but this. I shall ne'er get sight of the gates of life if the way of the cross I miss. The way of the cross leads home. The As I onward go, the way of the cross leads home. Then I bear farewell to the way of the world to walk in it never more. For my Lord says, Come, and I seek my home where he at the open door. The way of the cross 